the next 45 minutes, we're going to be talking about a series of offensive uh, RF exploitation techniques, particularly ones aimed at the physical and MAC layers of wireless communication systems. Reason why is because mobile and IoT means that wireless technology is more diverse and incumbent than it's ever been. So with that comes many more attack surfaces that we're excited to talk about and enumerate. So my name is Matt Knight. This is Mark Newland. We're both security researchers, researchers with Bastille Networks. Uh, we're motivated by wireless security. Uh, we think it's really exciting. We're happy, happy to be here. So we're going to begin with a brief historical rundown of the development of wired and wireless security technology. Uh, after that, we're going to move on to introduce some key RF concepts. And this is going to be pretty light, just enough to frame the rest of the discussion. And then we're going to move into what is really the body of this talk, which is our methods of wireless exploitation. And what we've done with this is we've looked at a number of high profile attacks from the last couple years. And for each one, uh, we've categorized them. And we've broken them out in terms of the uh, mechanics of how the attack is performed. Uh, and then what we're really going to try to emphasize is analogs that exist on wired networks. And the purpose of this is to try to demystify really what's happening in the, in the wireless domain. Uh, we're going to have some, uh, some uh, demos and videos, and uh, then we're going to leave you with some, uh, some advice. So let's jump right in. So say you're a network security administrator in the 1990s, and you want to take a look at what's going on in your network, uh, get some bits out, see what's happening. Well, it, there were really two protocols that you were concerned about. You had Ethernet and Token Ring. Uh, looking into these protocols involved buying an expensive, expensive computer, running some proprietary software on it. Totally proprietary, not that great. Fast forward to 1998, and Ethereal comes out. Uh, it's since rebranded. We know it as Wireshark. Um, what this did was it massively um, it, it took the proprietary solution and it made it a commodity. So very cheap, very easy to use, uh, and people were able to hack on it and extend it. So that's great. So let's look at what's happened since the 2000s. The map of protocols that we're concerned with is a little more complicated, right? So 802.3, and you know you can probably still find Token Ring some places. They're still there, but additionally we have tons of wireless, right? We've got this, uh, all these new protocols coming online, uh, so it's a lot more complicated. If you wanted to take a look at what was actually going on in the air in the 2000s, you could go out, you can buy an early software-defined radio, uh, and this would, you know, could easily run you six figures, um, be a big PCIe card that you'd have to hook, in, hook into a powerful computer or a, you know, network of computers. Uh, so, you know, it's proprietary, it's expensive, it's not that great. Uh, fast forward to 2012. And a Finnish, I believe he's Finnish, uh, hacker named Antti Palasari was looking at his DVB-T uh, over-the-air receiver. It's a USB stick that you can plug in and anywhere where there's uh, digital television with the um, uh, DVB-T standard, uh, you can pull that down and watch it, watch it on your computer. Well, he was looking at, the, uh, at the, the front end for that and realized that you could put it into a debug mode that would stream raw IQ, that's complex samples of the radio domain, back up to your host. So with a promiscuous driver, you can turn this into a poor man's software-defined radio. It's pretty sweet. So fast forward to 2017, and software-defined radios are totally commodity. Uh, for all sorts of price points, um, ca capability levels targeting you know, the hacker all the way up through the professional, something you can put into a product. Uh, it, th this, and this has revolutionized wireless security and the ability to look into these proprietary protocols. So in 2017, 802.11 is really just a piece of the puzzle when it comes to securing, securing RF. We know that with the growth of mobile and IoT, uh, there have emerged a number of different FIs, so really there's a physical layer for every use case. Uh, and many of these use cases target embedded systems. So embedded systems we know to have been designed around compromise. You know, oftentimes they're battery powered, so they have to last for years at a time. Uh, maybe they're, they're limited in terms of the type of processing they can do on it, their ability to do cryptography, you know, good and bad reasons for why systems might not support that. Uh, additionally, they may have limited network, um, so you might not be able to push firmware to them. Maybe they have non-rewritable uh, flash memory, so you can't uh, push a new image to them. And just one picture that I really love just to emphasize how complicated the deployment of embedded systems can be, I have it there on the slide. Uh, what you can't see are three literal embedded systems. They're embedded in concrete. So you can think that pushing firmware to that is quite a bit more complicated than Patch Tuesday. So combine that with an industry reliance on security through obscurity means that we as attackers have loads of targets. So. Uh, that was a, a whirlwind run through of the, the history. I'm going to hand it off to Mark and uh, he's going to get started. So as security practitioners, you're probably familiar with using tools like Wireshark to look at layer 2 traffic from 802.11 and 802.3 networks. And these allow you to use commodity hardware that give out these layer 2 packets. Uh, with this kind of sniffing, you can't really look at the physical layer simply because the hardware you're using does not support it. 
So in the case of a Wi-Fi adapter, this is something called a hardware-defined radio. And we say it's hardware-defined because the logic that makes it speak 802.11 is baked into silicon in the chip. However, in order to look at wireless protocols, and when we say wireless we mean non-802.11, you need some different type of hardware. So on the left here we have a picture of a spectrogram showing a few different RF physical layers. And we can see that they're visually different, and this is manifested in how they actually communicate over the air. And because we have all these different physical layers that you can't communicate with using a Wi-Fi adapter, we need to use something called a software-defined radio. And a software-defined radio is a flexible, generic, reconfigurable radio front end, and so you can change the center frequency, you can change the channel bandwidth, which is how much data you're pulling down, and you stream this raw radio data either to an FPGA or to your host computer. And this is great because all the logic that defines how the protocol operates, so whether it's 802.11 or Bluetooth or some proprietary protocol, this all exists in software. So instead of having one hardware defined radio for every different protocol, you can have one software defined radio and simply change the software on your host computer to speak these different protocols. And one of the downsides of software defined radio is that it can be fairly complex. And if you look at this image on the left, this is some um, RTL from a 802.15.4 software defined radio decoder that Matt implemented. And as you can see, it's super clear what's happening there, nice and low complexity. And you know, one of the uh, concerns people have with SDR is this assumption that you're going to need to know a lot of digital signal processing and other complex domain specific knowledge. And Matt and I have given a lot of time thinking about how to make software defined radio more accessible to people. And to this end, we've given a series of talks titled So You Want to Hack Radio. And the whole point of these talks is to explain how you can use great open source software and hardware written by some very smart people to abstract away a lot of the complexity. And one of our favorite tools for this is called GNU Radio. And on the right here, we have a picture of a GNU Radio companion flow graph. And this allows you to drag and drop these great open source signal processing blocks and implement your transceivers, transmitters, and receivers without having to understand the math that goes on under the hood. And I want to point out that Michael Osman and Balant Sieber have some great videos on SDR and GNU Radio in general up on YouTube, and I highly encourage you to look at those. Also, a lot of very, very smart SDR people hanging out in the wireless village if you want to go talk to them. And now Matt is going to talk to you a little bit about some fundamental RF concepts. All right, so the purpose of this next section is not to make you experts with digital signal processing. It's just to provide enough context around communications in the wireless domain to be able to frame the rest of the discussion. So when we talk about wireless protocols, we're invariably involving the physical layer. The physical layer is the lowest layer in our uh, communications model. And in wired protocols, it essentially defines how your ones and zeros get mapped into voltage timing and wiring, kind of the physical properties that underline the communica communication standard. In wireless, however, it defines how your ones and zeros get mapped into patterns of energy that are being sent over the RF medium. So RF uh, is essentially the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, you know, all wireless signals, um, if you sum them all up, it, you get a picture like this, this is a spectrogram. Uh, you have signals at different frequencies carrying information. It's kind of just like one big shared medium. Uh, so manipulating RF can be done with a radio. As Mark outlined, they can either be soft hardware defined or software defined. But the key function that the radio performs is called the modulation. And the modulation is a function that exactly maps how those digital values get mapped into RF energy. It's kind of the core element of your wireless physical layer. So I'm briefly going to run through what happens uh, from the perspective of a radio when you tell it to send a message. You know, if you've developed a wireless system before, you probably get to the point where you call driver.send and you pass it a buffer, right? So you make an API call. And then that writes it out over SPI or I2C or some interface to, to radio chipset. But what does that really do to make, uh, to make your bits magically appear in another system that could be some distance away? So the first thing that, that radio is going to do when it receives the buffer is it's going to append some information to it. So it's going to prepend a header, which includes a preamble, a sort of frame delimiter, and maybe some, some header specific values. It's going to upend a CRC so that it can check for errors that might occur during transmission. It's then going to perform that modulation function where those ones and zeros are going to get turned into a waveform. That waveform then gets run through an RF front end, which can include some filtering and, uh, and some gain stages to make it more powerful, and then it gets pushed out to an antenna. And it goes out into the electromagnetic spectrum, into the RF medium that carries it to its destination. The receiver is a little more complicated. So your waveform gets picked up by the antenna, get, gets run through a demodulator, and that produces a stream of bits that wind up in a, in, in a physical layer state machine. And if you uh, were to break this down, it looks something like this. Um, we're not going to go through this in detail. If you want to learn about how these physical layer state machines work, that's all what that talk, So You Want to Hack Radios, is all about, the one that Mark mentioned earlier. Uh, so we're not going to cover that here. Uh, there's some content out there if you want to know how it works. But essentially the physical layer state machine spins on that stream of, uh, stream of information coming from the demodulator 
and ultimately presents a layer two frame back up to your back up to your your uh, your host. So uh, the key concepts to take away from this is that radios are state machines and they're deterministic, right? What happens isn't magic, and the implementation of these state machines is informed by the fact that RF is very complicated. You have lots of contention from uh, from other interferers, other other um, actors within the medium, whether they be uh, unintentional. Or intentional. You know, you could be unintentional just in terms of you know being in the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band where Wi-Fi lives. Wi-Fi is really active, or it could be intentional if you have the case of somebody trying to jam you. Anyway, these radios are designed with features to compensate for the fact that this medium is very uh, very complicated and failure prone. So between all this, we can find some some interesting cases that we can begin to abuse uh, to construct some novel attacks. So that brings us to our methods of wireless exploitation. So what we've done here is we've categorized the major wireless attacks that uh, that have occurred in the last couple of years, uh, and we're going to present them to you. For each each category, we're going to show the method of how the attack is performed, the impact that it enables, and number three is the big one. We're going to highlight analogous attacks that exist on wired or IP networks if such ones exist. And again, this is just to provide as much context around the wireless domain in terms of how it's similar and how it's different than wire, uh, wired attacks. We're going to present some uh, limit, limiting factors, whether it's incidental or intentional uh, mitigations or limitations. We're going to provide some examples, and then we're going to provide some demos as well. So uh, to kick it off, I'll pass it back over to Mark, and he's going to take you through sniffing. So when we speak about sniffing in this context, we're talking about sniffing the physical layer. And there's really no analog to this in the wired domain. As I said, with like an Ethernet adapter, for example, you're unable to see the physical layer packets. You're only looking at layer two and higher. Sniffing allows you to observe the RF medium that's in use by other devices that you do not control and recover data that they're transmitting if they're unencrypted, for example. Or you can have a reconnaissance goal and enumerate devices and environment for future attacks. The big limitation of RF physical layer sniffing is range. And you have to be physically proximate to a device. And when we say physically proximate, we don't mean in the same room, we just mean within range of the budget of your antenna and your amplifier. There are a couple of interesting sniffing attacks in the last couple of years. Uh, Matt has demonstrated that you can recover the cryptography key from this Zigbee door lock by sniffing the pairing sequence that happens between the lock and the smart hub. And then you can operate the lock yourself and walk into somebody's home. Last year I did a bunch of research into wireless keyboard security and I demonstrated that a lot of keyboards on the market are actually unencrypted and vulnerable to keystroke sniffing. So for a demo here, I'm going to be looking at the HP Classic Wireless Desktop Keyboard and this is based on a transceiver from a company called Mozart Semiconductor. And this is a unencrypted wireless keyboard transceiver that I reverse engineered last year. And it's actually over the air compatible with these common Nordic Semiconductor NRF24L transceivers. So it's possible to use this off the shelf hardware defined radio to sniff unencrypted keystrokes from this particular device. Now we're just going to switch over to a quick video demo here. So on the left, we have a keyboard focus on this terminal. On the right, we're running a sniffer script with one of these Nordic NRF24 dongles. And as we see when I'm typing with the focus on the left terminal, that's the actual input from the keyboard. And on the right, it's actually sniffing these unencrypted keystrokes and printing it out. And this is a, a you know, pretty low complexity example of a sniffing attack. And now Matt is going to speak to you about word driving. Okay, so war driving is really a nuance on, uh, on the sniffing attack. Essentially, war driving involves conducting sniffing, but while doing so, scanning for identifying features uh, of a protocol or device of interest. Optionally, we have the ability to actively beacon to attempt to induce traffic from devices that we're looking for. So the impact here is we're able to discover and enumerate exploitable devices or networks that might be present within your physical environment. Uh, and a wired analog uh, to this is port scanning, you know, using Nmap to go and knock on doors to see what services uh, might, be, might be present on a system or a network. Uh, on the right we have a screenshot from Kismet, which is a really popular, um, uh, really popular wireless um, kind of reconnaissance framework that enables, uh, enables war driving, among other things. Uh, so some limitations, uh, you have the same constraints placed on you that you do with sniffing. Uh, additionally, you need to manage uh, channels if you're looking for a system that might be on, on multiple channels. You might have some, uh, some front ends to manage in terms of how you, you share your time among all, all the different frequencies you could be looking at. Additionally, active war driving can be very easy to spot if your defender knows to look for it. Because you might be hopping from channel to channel, kicking off a beacon on each one. Uh, if, if you're aware of that, that's going to leave a big footprint that you're going to be able to identify. 
So a classic example of war driving is, of course, your, your 802.11 AP Discovery. And, you know, think guys like back in, back in the uh, you know, early 2000s driving around with their laptops and custom-made cantennas looking for free Wi-Fi. Uh, it's kind of the, the classic example. However, a more uh, modern and IoT-focused focused example is uh, war driving for 802.15.4 coordinators. Uh, so 802.15.4 war driving, I'm going to show you a quick video of it in a minute. Uh, for this, I use the killer B exploitation framework to crash broadcast beacon re request messages. And then I use the app emote hardware defined radio board to send them out and listen for responses. So what this will do is uh, it'll channel hop through all the, uh, the 802.15.4 channels in the uh, 2.4 gigahertz band, sending out these requests. And if a coordinator sees, is present and sees that, it'll respond with a response. We'll see what that looks like. Do we have the video here? Okay. I'm not sure if that video made the transition with all the, uh, the, the AV stuff, so we'll get that up online. You can watch it afterward. So the next attack is a replay attack. And a replay attack is a command injection attack that involves retransmitting a previously captured physical layer frame. Now this can either be a frame that you've demodulated and have the, uh, have the, the, the bits for, and then you resynthesize with a, with a modulator and send out, or it can even be as easy as retransmitting a raw captured physical layer frame, your raw radio information. The impact here uh, is command injection. You can change the state of a network or device by getting it to recreate previously observed uh, activity. Uh, so the wired analog is exactly the same. You can have replay attacks on wired networks too. So some uh, limitations of this is that the replay attack is pretty easily defeated with uh, uh, using and enforcing freshness, so sequence number, or authentication, having a, uh, a cryptographic handshake uh, to establish the authenticity of the message. Uh, so one high profile example of this uh, came just a couple, couple months ago. Uh, you may have seen in the news that uh, at around 1.30 in the morning on a Tuesday or Wednesday, all 156 uh, emergency tornado alert sirens in the Dallas metro metropolitan area started going off and just playing this really shrill, loud noise. It took the authorities about 90 minutes to get it under control and, and get those turned off. Uh, obviously, that inconvenienced people who were in Dallas who were woken up by it, but it also uh, gave people a lot of cause for concern because uh, this was right around when some saber rattling with North Korea was happening, so it made a lot of people pretty uncomfortable. Uh, we at Bastille have done a lot of analysis on, on what we believe this is, and we've concluded that we believe that it's, it's an RF replay attack. The systems are tested, uh, I believe it's quarterly, so it would be trivial for an attacker with a software-defined radio to capture that signal and then go back and replay it uh, at a later date to induce that behavior. So the logistics of getting an authentic tornado siren uh, into Caesar's palace is a little, it's a little bit much. Um, so instead I have a surrogate uh, that I'm going to show to you. I have a fortress security safeguard panic button. Uh, so this is going to be our surrogate. Uh, essentially, you've got this little siren, a remote controller to control it. Um, it's a very simple uh, on-off key protocol, no freshness or authentication. So I'm just going to grab some raw IQ, and then we're going to replay it to, uh, to induce the attack. And um, I'm going to do it within the Faraday cage here. We were going to do our, uh, our cellular demo in here, but I brought it all this way, and I want to use it. So bear with me. So now we're going to capture the output from the transmitter for this device. Then we're going to replay this and demonstrate that we can set off this siren just from this RF capture. I had the siren turned off. I'm going to turn it on again and we're going to play the signal into it. You, you really shouldn't clap for that. It's very easy. <laughs> okay, uh, so that brings us to our next attack, which is jamming, and I'll pass it over to Mark. So the concept behind jamming is pretty straightforward, and it's somewhat analogous to a denial of service attack, except a little bit lower complexity. So imagine we have Alice, Bob, and Carlos trying to communicate on a wireless medium, and Donald wants to come and blast a bunch of nonsense noise to prevent them from communicating. In this case, Donald would be implementing a jamming attack. 
and jamming allows you to transmit noise to prevent the RF medium from being used by other devices or networks. So you can block traffic or potentially disrupt the network state. There are a couple, uh, you know, limitations to jamming attacks. One is that a lot of devices implement a jamming detection mechanism where they can see if somebody's trying to jam them and then alter their behavior. The other big downside is that if you're trying to jam a network, you don't have the ability to both jam and listen to the network at the same time. So if you're trying to do reconnaissance, you can't prevent traffic as well as receive it. There's a good uh, example of a jamming attack that our colleague Logan Lamb discovered two years ago. He was looking at home security systems provided by ADT, and he discovered that you can actually jam the wireless link between these door and window sensors and the control panel that sets off the alarm. And so in this case, the door and window sensor, when you open and close it, it will transmit a RF message to the control panel and tell the control panel that the state has changed, in this case a door or window has opened or closed, and then set off the alarm. What Logan discovered is that you can jam the 345 megahertz channel that these devices operate in and then simply walk into somebody's home and the alarm system will not go off. So to demonstrate this, we have a video we recorded about an hour ago inside the Faraday cage. So here we have the control panel from the home security system. We're opening and closing the sensor and we can see that the alarm state has not changed. And in this case we're jamming it. So now we go and we stop the jammer and now we'll be able to actually open and close the sensor and we see that the alarm is triggered. And this is a very, very simple attack. So for these simple kind of jamming attacks, uh, there are actually uh, some different types of smart jamming that we can use to evade these jamming detection mechanisms. So there's a concept called duty cycle jamming. And a lot of hardware defined radios will only try and transmit when other devices are not transmitting on the channel. The reason they do this, if you have two devices transmitting at the same time, they will accidentally jam each other. And there's a feature called clear channel assessment, where a hardware defined radio will listen to the energy level in the channel it's trying to use, and if it detects another device, it will not transmit. So for example, if we have a packet length of 10 milliseconds, the device will say if the channel is occupied for more than that 10 milliseconds then it's likely somebody's jamming and then alter the behavior. So what we can do is pulse our jammer on and off and we can jam for 9 milliseconds and then turn it off for a millisecond and then turn it back on. And by doing this we can still effectively jam a channel without actually triggering these jam detection mechanisms. And Matt has publicly demonstrated this with an 802.15.4 anti-jam detection evasion. And we also have something called reflexive jamming and this allows you to target specific devices or packets on a wireless network. The way this works, you listen to the packet coming in, you could decode the header, then you make a determination based on one of the addresses in the header or the specific packet that's being transmitted, and then you start jamming as soon as you make this determination. And this allows you to jam the end of the packet and, for example, cause a CRC failure. A good public example of this is Sammy Cam Car's roll jam device, which he released. And now there's a bit of a virtual jamming we can do that takes advantage of a Mac layer reservation system in 802.11 networks. So if you're a 802.11 device and you're trying to transmit a packet, you include a duration field in the MAC header. And this duration field specifies the amount of time you expect it to take for you to transmit your packet and receive an ACK. Other devices on the network or within range will listen to this duration field and assume that the channel is going to be occupied for this amount of time. They will then turn off their radios to save power instead of sensing the RF energy on the channel. So we can actually take advantage of this by sending a zero payload length 802.11 packet with a duration field set to the maximum and trick other devices for not transmitting for the next 32 milliseconds. And this allows us to have a very low duty cycle of transmission but effectively jam a channel. So for a demo here, I have a single one line SCAPI script which I'm going to transmit some of these packets on and we'll demonstrate that we can prevent another device on a separate network from communicating. So here on the right we have a device, a client pinging its access point. I run the SCAPI script and on the right we can see that the pings have stopped. I've sent 50 packets in this case. Then after a few seconds we'll see that the pings start again and this is uh, pretty neat because we've been able to send only 50 packets and effectively jam the channel for several seconds. Now we have a type of attack called an evil twin. And this is something you may have heard of. Uh, as you can see by the beard here on the right, this is an evil twin access point. And the concept behind an evil twin is that we can convince other devices to connect to our access point or base station instead of the access point or base station they are intending to connect to. And this allows us to man in the middle of the traffic. This is very similar to an ARP spoofing or ARP cache poisoning attack on a wired network. The big limitation here is that there is often trust that exists between client 
and access points or base stations. And so in order to effectively implement an evil twin attack, we need to be able to either turn off that trust or replicate the state of that cryptography. The Wi-Fi Pineapple is a good off-the-shelf device that allows you to implement a Wi-Fi evil twin attack. Their device is called empty catchers, which allow you to do the same for cellular networks and convince devices to connect to your malicious base station. So for a demo here, we're going to use a fake base station that we spun up with a software-defined radio and use the OpenBTS software. And I want to point out that it's very, very illegal to try and trick other people's phones to connect into your base station, so please do not do this. And now we'll show a quick video demo. So here we have a cell phone in the Faraday cage and at the time we started this video I've also turned on a cellular base station which is running on a software defined radio in the cage and right now we can see at the top of the phone that it's not connected and as soon as we turn on our fake base station the phone is searching for the network it is starting to register and then now we have the phone you can see the change there the phone is now registered on our network and this is something we've spun up with open source software on a software defined radio. And now Matt is going to speak to you about malicious over the air firmware updates. Okay, we're going to cover this one quickly. So, a malicious over the air firmware update attack involves first modifying a firmware image to suit your liking, right? This can be adding any value to it that you might want. Uh, you then exploit the fact that your target device, uh, if it has one, uh, has an over the air firmware update mechanism where you can use its wireless network to deliver new software to it. So, the impact here is you can, you can basically extend the device to, to conduct behavior that the manufacturer didn't intend. So this can include remaining persistent on the device, uh, you know, denial of service is a big one that we saw uh, last year um, with Brickerbot, which is a Mirai variant. It can also be uh, self, self propagating too, just like a traditional end, your a traditional endpoint malware or worms. So uh, the limitations here is th that this is pretty easily defeated by, um, by signing your code you know, using secure boot or an equivalent technology uh, or encrypting your network and doing so well. Uh, if you do either of those things you're going to make it a lot harder to execute an attack like this. So there are two examples we're just going to describe briefly. Uh, the first was uh, uh, Cesar Cerudo from IO Active, uh, his hypothetical um, uh, traffic light sensor worm, uh, which was a, a 802.15.4 based system. He f uh, analyzed it a couple of years ago at Black Hat, found that it was uh, completely unencrypted and they weren't signing their images, so it was trivial for him uh, to uh, make his own and, and push it. And he then theorized that you could make it self-propagating and, and go from there. Uh, such a, an IoT worm was actually demonstrated at the end of last year with a Philips Hue Zigbee Lightlink worm. There were a number of researchers that contributed to it. Uh, they did such a good job with this. I'm just going to direct you to their website. Um, the paper's really good and their video's awesome. They strap a 15.4 radio to a drone and fly it up to an office building and hacks the lights. It's cool. Um, so um, check that out. They do a better job of showing it than we could. So this is our last uh, type of attack that we're going to highlight in this session. And that's what we're going to call physical layer selective targeting. And I'm just going to first talk about this. It's a, it's a little, it's, I think it's pretty interesting. So, when it comes to developing wireless standards, you have your standards body, you know, your IEEE, um, your uh, 3GPP. They get together and they determine what they want the protocol to look like and what features they want it to have, um, what the physical layer looks like, how it integrates with other systems, et cetera. They then take, take those thoughts and they turn them into, you know, a several thousand page document. It's very technical, lots of details. That document then gets handed off to a chipset manufacturer who has to interpret it, right? So they take that and they kind of take their best, best effort to implement that standard as well as they can. Well, as you might imagine, they, there are some nuances as to, as to how, how accurate or, or how similar they all do that. So we can exploit that. We can exploit the fact that different chipsets have different radio state machines. So what we can do is we can fingerprint the state machine and then sta send standards non-compliant transmissions to exploit corner cases within it. And the impact here is we can do things like uh, selectively avoid certain targeted receivers, um, which is useful in the case of avoiding an IDS, uh, for example. We can also dev do device fingerprinting. We can uh, send a number of, of frames with different characteristics, see what comes back, and with that we can figure out what kind of radio chipset is present within our environment. Uh, so this has been uh, demonstrated on 802.3 Ethernet networks uh, in the case of avoiding LAN taps, but this is far more practical in the RF domain where the domain is really defined by promiscuity. The fact that you don't have to be physically connected to a bus in order to get at it uh, makes this quite a bit more interesting. So some limitations here. In order for this to work, uh, you're, you're counting on network participants being on different chipsets. If they're all on the same chipset, they're going to be able to see the same type of malformed message. So I'm going to show you a quick example of an 802.15.4 receiver evasion attack, which is pretty interesting. 
uh, essentially I'm using uh, one transmitter in app emote to craft various, uh, variously de uh, deformed 15.4 messages and then I'm going to use two different receivers that have different chipsets, thereby different state machines to receive them. So I'll just roll a quick video and talk you through it. So up on top we have our transmitter and then we have two 15.4 receivers on the bottom. On the left we have an app mail receiver and on the right we have a TI receiver. Five compliant messages to get started. Now I'm going to insert two extra symbols into the header of uh, of the the 15.4 file. And you'll see that the RZ USB stick receives that but the app emote does not. Now I'll oh, the video's cut short. Um I'll release the full video online. Um by taking two symbols out of the header we're able to target the um able to target the the uh, TI radio and avoid the um the uh, app mail radio. This brings us to the end. Uh so we've looked at a number of different types of attacks uh and we've drawn some analogs between them. The key thing that I want to highlight with this is that some attacks are quite difficult to implement but some are very hard to mitigate. So anything involving uh, RF promiscuity is very hard to avoid just by by nature of how the RF medium works. The fact that uh, that your electromagnetic magnetic energy radiates outward means that for a stood up attacker there are lots they can do with it. It's very hard to conceal that. Additionally this is a non exhaustive list. Uh, as you start to get into wireless I'm sure you'll find many other ways of exploiting wireless. Uh, we think we've done a fairly comprehensive job of boiling down kind of the essence of many of these attacks into a few different categories to kind of get you started. So as attackers uh, the bits of advice I'll leave you with is to always look for low hanging fruit first because the easiest attacks um are are you know you want to start with the easy attacks before you go to more complex things because the complexity goes up in a hurry. As we've seen there are uh, analogous attacks on wired networks so you can lean on your existing skill set wherever possible. Additionally leverage open source intelligence. Those are things like FCC regulatory filings and data sheets because they'll make your life easy. If you want to learn more about that Mark gave an entire talk on that at Hack in the Box in 2016. Go look that up if you're curious. And one last note, this is both a um this is both a uh, a challenge to everybody in the room and also a warning to developers. Know that we're living in the golden age of RF hacking. It's because software defined radio has been a commodity for more than five years. That really means that every wireless spy is in scope. Uh obscurity is not relevant anymore. Uh you can buy the tools, you can make the tools to expose just about any wireless spy that you'd like. So uh go forth, uh own the airwaves if you're an attacker, go make them your own. If you're a defender, be aware of these threats. Uh, we have some uh, radio resources if you want to learn more about this. Uh, we just tweeted them out, so don't try to take pictures of the slide. You'll be able to get them online. I uh, want to acknowledge our team at Bastille and DEF CON for having us. And uh, thanks very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>